Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, very honored to receive any award uh, named after Gail Warden. That's an amazing thing, and I, I thank all the people associated with NCHL. Uh, also, great to uh, be up here after Peggy was here. Uh, meeting Peggy, which I did the first time a few months ago, was like meeting fame, because for uh, the 15, last 15 years, I've been working to get my HEDIS scores up, but I didn't actually know her, right? So it's like, I think that's true fame when you know about someone's, you know, accomplishments before you know them. I'm hoping to meet whoever invented Velcro, because I was <laughs> next, my son's having trouble with his shoelaces. And, and, you know, if you've raised a boy, you understand what I mean. Um, the uh, challenges for public systems, um, I think, in the next few years are particularly important for all of us to work together on. Uh, I love public hospitals and public clinics. I don't think that the whole world should be public hospitals and public clinics. I think that the key thing is to figure out where the public sector best fits into the things that others can do uh, along with the public sector and the private sector. And Healthy San Francisco was very much meant as, as let's bring all of the resources together uh, in San Francisco, the public, the private, to provide care to everyone regardless of their income or immigration status. Part of why I moved to Los Angeles was that I was actually offended as a public health person with some of the things that I saw and read about. Um, many of you uh, undoubtedly heard of the closing of MLK and it wasn't just the fact that that hospital which would, had been really promised to the community of Watts in a very difficult time. Not only that it closed, but even worse what had happened prior to its close. And I felt that it was a blemish on all of us who want to work in the public sector, who want to believe that the public sector really can do great things, uh, that we really can provide wonderful care. And a lot of my uh, decision to leave San Francisco and go to Los Angeles was that I wanted to see what might be possible for what is the second largest healthcare system in the United States, except unlike the small one that I ran in San Francisco, one with a very different history. Uh, you know, a large number of directors in a very short period of time, two and a half years, they had no director. Uh, so sort of if you think about, you know, I know today was spent thinking about leadership, what sort of message does that send to an organization if for two and a half years there's no leader in place? That there's a, you know, a sweet fellow who very much wanted to retire who continues out of responsibility to do it because nobody can agree to take the position. And what does it mean when a hospital closes, when there are a number of uh, serious deficiencies uh, in the hospital? And to me, what this meant was, you know, this is a great opportunity to take this system and really try to make it into something fantastic. And that's what I want to spend, you know, the, the next, uh, you know, period of my life doing. Uh, Los Angeles is in some way em uh, emblematic of both the the difficult things about public hospitals and systems and the great things. So the great thing, which is what leads uh, many people, including myself, to want to do it, is can't beat the mission, right? The idea of being able to take care of everybody without regard to their ability to pay and really uh, be able to do that not just under, you know, narrow Imtala laws where you're taking care of someone but sending them a large bill, but really under the ability to take care of people, whatever their needs, and not send them a bill if they really cannot pay for it. That's an amazing thing. Um, however, there is a dark side, if you will, to ha what happens in the culture of public hospitals. And this is the thing that, that I, I've spent my life trying to push against, which is the, the sort of insidious feeling that, well, if you're seeing people that nobody else is seeing, well, then you must be better than everybody else, right? Because they won't see your patients. And therefore, if your patients have to wait a long time, well, you know, they can't really be seen anywhere else. No one else will see them, right? And I, I remember a very important moment in my life when early on, uh, a somewhat pompous physician said to me, you know, well, you know, we take care of people that nobody else will take care of. And without thinking, because it wasn't a very politic answer, I said, but you don't do it for free. 
Uh, you get paid. This is, you know, you're reimbursed for doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, that it, it was important for me to set a mark, which is to say that, that yes, it's an amazing thing to take care of people without ability to pay, but it, they are entitled to the same quality care as anybody else. And it is easy under poverty medicine circumstances when you feel that there's never enough resources to convince yourself that it doesn't matter. And so, for example, the first time I said, well, we're not, uh, I, I discovered much, you know, to my horror that Los Angeles uh, was still doing block appointments. So, you know, 250 women would receive an appointment to get a pap and pelvic at 9 a.m. And of course, the women weren't stupid. They knew that their appointment wasn't really for 9 a.m. They knew it was just the morning. So they would come starting at 6 a.m., right? Because they knew that really the way it was going to work was first come, first serve. And so if you got in early enough, then you might be able to get um, to your job and earn money for your family. So now, this was not a, you know, 25 years ago, there were many systems that did this. Um, I was somewhat horrified to find out that the system I had n newly come to was still doing it. Um, I was even more surprised that when I said, no, we're not going to do this, there was actual pushback. And I got, well, people come by the bus anyway, so they get here when they get here. Um, our patients have a lot of trouble, you know, keeping appointments, so, you know, it's okay. You know, they're not working, so it doesn't matter. Um, and it was actually fairly difficult, um, you know, to push back on something that, I, you know, struck me as just an obvious, you know, time warp. You know, I, you know I, I wasn't angry at anyone. I'm like, you know, I just don't understand why you're stuck, you know, in 25-year-ago practices. Let's, let's stop that. Um, I also uh, surprised people, and uh, it, it's going to come to one of two pieces of, of advice I want to offer uh, you uh, in your own systems uh, when I said that all administrative physicians uh, had to see patients. And part of why um, I did this was that I was deeply troubled, and it, uh, Los Angeles and public systems are not unique, when I noticed that the way the career path was for physicians, right, you started as a clinical physician, maybe you saw 80%, and then you became an assistant director, and then you saw did 60% of your time, and then you became, uh, you went to the next level, and then you did 20%, and you got promoted one more time, and now you don't do any. Well, what's the message? Isn't it the message that the better you are, the less time you would spend caring for people? And to me, especially coming at Los Angeles, you know, my, my thinking is, what, if there's one thing I have to do here, I have to connect people with what the mission of this organization is, right? We are a patient care organization. We're here to take good care of people. And therefore, I need all of the leaders, you know, who are clinicians to take care of people. And we've done the same thing now with nurses. We've done the same thing. I've said, someone pushed back on me and said, well, it's easy for you to do that, Mitch, because you can see patients, right? And you're a doctor, I'm not. I said, well, you don't need to be a doctor to see patients, right? We need people at registration. Right, we need people to answer the telephone, right, and requiring that all of the people in my organization interact directly with patients. And part of what happened in the process is a lot of people refound their own inspiration for why they, in fact, got into medicine or got into the healthcare system. I mean, you can't, you know, look at any system and not be amazed at how much more idealistic people are when they start than when they've been in it many years. And there are exceptions to that, people who manage to really keep that inspiration going. But people generally start very idealistic. And so getting people back to the practice of if they were doctors or nurses um, into what they were doing had an amazing transformational effect that went way beyond sort of what I had imagined in terms of how people then looked at them differently. So the piece of advice I just want to mention about physicians is, and, and Peggy referred to it, physicians are not the easiest group to work with. And any of you who are hospital administrators know what I mean. 
Um, there is something, and I say this as a physician, right, and it doesn't matter, by the way, uh, when I say d it's being a physician does not make it easier to deal with other physicians. So <laughs> please understand, I'm not, what, that, it's not the question. The question is, when you are trying to organize care as, as CEOs, quality people in your organizations, you have to engage the physicians, and it isn't easy. They are not easy to engage. For one thing, medicine tends to promote the individual, uh, I'm smarter than he is kind of culture, right? It, it exists till the present day. You know, we talk about, you know, working together and these teams on every hospital in this country. If we were listening in, we would find a doctor making fun of another doctor. Can you believe they put her on that medicine? I can't imagine what they were thinking, that there is something about sort of the sort of training, the individualism, the you know, highest scorer kind of things that we pre-select, that, that that's the culture. But, but at the same time, if you engage them, right, you will find that that same idealism exists, and they will follow you. They will follow you if you suggest meaningful ways to improve the system. And, and certainly, it isn't about, you know, just physician money incentives, right? As, as you know, uh, incentives have been shown to have a major effect on systems, not so much on individual physicians. So I think you have to go and really focus on why they're there and, and what we have as administrators, again, whether we're physician administrators or other professional administrators, what we have, you know, to help them, right? It, it reminds me a little bit of the, you know, that commercial, if you're afraid of your teenager, you know, you're, you can't be a very good parent to them. I've seen uh, CEOs be very deferential to physicians. It's the wrong approach. Get in there with them. Don't be deferential. Be part of it. Insist that they're part of it. You will find that you will make a huge difference. Um, and then uh, what, I, what I'd like to, to close on the thought is how much, and it's certainly been my experience in Los Angeles, but, but maybe broader, is how much the attitude that we bring to work has on the people that we work with. Um, I was seeing patients in this very sweet uh, clinic that I work in in East LA, and uh, the doctor who was working with me that day, actually quite a good doctor, um, but I noticed, you know, that she was having a struggling afternoon and perhaps she was feeling overwhelmed by patients or she was overwhelmed by other things going on in her life. Uh, I, I don't know. But in the middle of this interaction, uh, after I had saw a patient, I said to her, you know, it's so great to work here. I really like seeing patients here. And it was, it was from the heart. It was how I felt. And what she, there was this pause, and you could see the flicker. And she said, you know, I do too. Um, and it, it, it made a huge difference to me because this is if there, if ever that, that old axiom that uh, culture eats strategy for lunch is true, you have to meet the Los Angeles, you know, health service system, <laughs> right? Because uh, one of the nicest things that, that uh, anyone has said to me since I joined it was that, you know, Mitch, it's good that you're the director because you're not beaten down, right? And, and you know, it, it's n it was nobody who was working there's fault that after a while people felt beaten down, that they felt that it could, that their system wasn't good, they knew that, and, but they also felt it couldn't be any good. And so a lot of my time I spend showing people that one thing, I believe it really will be great. I believe it can be great. I believe that public systems can be tremendously successful um, and that we have a lot of great resources. And I think that, that if each of us in our day, whatever public or private or whatever office setting really brings in the attitude of, you know, what an amazing privilege it is to be part of helping people to be healthier. I mean, what an amazing way we get to spend our life. I mean, what an amazing mission, whether that's as a doctor or a nurse or an administrator or a planner, what an amazing thing 
it truly is to do. Uh, thank you so much for this award.